Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, I'm Janat Carr with the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. You are welcome for the webinar dedicated to the 10 year mark since the unprecedented extraordinary triple disaster which happened in Japan, the Great East Japan earthquake, tsunami, and following the nuclear power plant accident in uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. That happened in March uh, 11, on March 11, 2011. And this month we are commemorating the 10 years anniversary. We have an amazing um, lineup of uh, distinguished speakers who kindly agreed to uh, present uh, during the WHO webinar. And uh, without further delay, I will pass the floor to the Assistant Director General for the Division of Healthier Population, Populations and uh, Universal Health Coverage, Dr. Um, Naoko Yamamoto, to open the webinar. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Janat. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is a great emotions that I opened this webinar on behalf of the World Health Organization on the occasion of the 10th year mark since unprecedented triple disaster. It is hard to believe that 10 years have already passed since March 2011, an event that shocked Japan and the entire world. And it is with thorough that we remember the lives of thousands of victims of the tsunami and those lost during the early response to the nuclear accident as a result of evacuation. We unite the people of Japan who lost their loved one, who lost homes, jobs, and livestock, and those whose lives, lives have changed forever. During the first week and month after the disaster, the World Health Organization offered assistance to Japan. The WHO Western Pacific Regional Office sent expert mission to the tsunami affected regions and WHO headquarters in Geneva cooperated with relevant UN agencies to provide advice on topics related to health risks, public health measures, water and food safety, international travel and trade. Those were a tough month, but after followed was equally hard. Thousands of evacuees had to settle a new homes. Some of them had to live in shelters for many months. Throughout the following years, the government of Japan, responding agencies and authorities have been working tirelessly toward reconstruction and recovery of the affected region. Some of the evacuees were allowed to return to the homes. Things are steadily recovering and improving. This disaster has taught the global community invaluable lessons in the resilience and humanity of the people of Japan. We as a global community are acknowledging their contribution with great respect and gratitude. The World Health Organization has a strong historic ties and cooperation with several Japanese institutions through WHO collaborating centers mechanism. These include Radiation Effects Research Foundation in Hiroshima, Nagasaki University, the National Institute of Radio Radiological Science in Chiba, and most recently, Fukushima Medical University, that was designated in 2018. These, were, these and other members of WHO Global Network Ramtham conduct research and recovery activities and they share their results with a global expert community. This is extremely valuable and greatly appreciated. As the knowledge of health consequences of nuclear emergencies is still very limited and was previously based mainly on the lessons from the Chernobyl accident in 1986. Based on the Chernobyl experiences, the issue of childhood thyroid screening was placed at the center of attention and concern of affected parents, physicians, scientists in the Fukushima prefecture. Also, 
like Chernobyl, the psychosocial impact of Fukushima's accident on human health seems to be enduring today. This has prompted WHO to develop a framework for mental health and psychosocial support published in November 2020 where we consider the experience of Fukushima experts as well as experience gained from other type of emergencies and natural disasters. Global cooperation is important for advancing science for strengthening <coughs> global emergency preparedness. This has become even more evident during the response to COVID-19 pandemic, where WHO is fully engaged in the battle against the virus, against misinformation, and for global access to diagnostic tests and vaccines. The current pandemic underlines once again the importance of clear scientific information to be communicated to the public. This aspect has a striking similarity with the response to nuclear accidents. This communication is often obscured by uncertainty and unclearness in the beginning. People can be frustrated and scared and angry. And it is often the, the medical doctors, nurses, and public health workers that people turn for help and advice. In recognition of their dedication, WHO has designated 2021 as the International Year of Health Care Workers. We hope today's webinar will be giving you a picture of the unanimous amount of work our colleagues are leading in the area of affected by the Fukushima disaster. I would like to thank all speakers and look forward to continuing our collaboration toward Fukushima's recovery. I wish you a productive and successful meeting. I thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Emamoto. Our next um, welcome address comes from the uh, permanent mission of Japan to the UN organization in Geneva and uh, Dr. Naoki Akahani is the first secretary. Please, the floor is yours. Um, uh, good, good morning, <coughs> sorry. Uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. I try to be very brief because uh, we have um, excellent presentations a number of excellent presentations today. Um, so yeah, first of all, uh, we thank our colleagues at WHO uh, for convening this timely webinar and also thank the distinguished experts joining this webinar for sharing their insights and knowledge on the public health consequences of the Fukushima nuclear accident. Um, March 11th this year marked 10 years since the Great East uh, Japan earthquake and the accident at TEPCO's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station. So my thoughts are with those who have been affected uh, by the earthquake and the accident. Um, it has been a full 10 years since the accident and the earthquake, but at the same time, we can say that it has been only 10 years. I, I also experienced the earthquake in Japan and was uh, involved in the response. And uh, I still remember those days as vividly as if it were just yesterday. Um, today, uh, distinguished experts will talk you through uh, what we have learned throughout the past decade and what has happened during these 10 years. As you will see, uh, we have learned a lot over these 10 years, but our learning will continue without an end. We hope this learning can provide reassurance to those who are affected by the accident and also help us and our world to be more resilient. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Akahani. Um, you're absolutely right. It's extremely important for the global community to have access to this information to, uh, and our colleagues uh, in Japan, they are sharing the um, results of their work and it is absolutely invaluable. So the first speaker um, in our webinar is Professor uh, Sunichi Yamashita, who is now Director General of the Center for Advanced Radiation Emergency Medicine, 
within the National Institutes for Quantum and Radiological Science and Technology in Chiba, Japan. It, he is the director of our collaborating center. And previously, back in uh, 2007, 2006, he was with uh, our program in WHO. And he worked here in Geneva for two years. And, and uh, the beautiful cherry trees alley is uh, something what we will always remember Professor Yamashita stay with. Uh, he actually organized for these trees being planted. Uh, it was a gift from the permanent mission of Japan to the WHO. Dear Sunji, uh, the floor is yours. And um, I'm going to show his slides just a second. I need to share my uh, screen for that. Share screen, share sound. And you should be able to see my screen. Full screen. No. Dear members and distinguished guests, it's a great honor and pleasure on behalf of the Japanese colleagues in the arena of radiation emergency medicine. We have a, do we have an issue? And those evaluation to look back over the past 10 years of public health consequences of Fukushima disaster at the special occasion of the 10th years since the Great East Japan earthquake and the subsequent accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, but significantly challenges still remain. My name is Shunichi Yamashita, and now please to introduce briefly the overview of public emergency and early response of Fukushima. As all of you know, on March 11, 2011, a tremendous earthquake of magnitude 9 occurred in eastern Japan and a huge tsunami attacked the east northern coast of Japan, including Fukushima Daiichi and Daini nuclear power plants. The nuclear reactors of Fukushima Daiichi eventually, within several days, total uh, loss of their schooling system, resulting in the meltdown of Unit 1, 2, and 3, and subsequently, this hydrogen explosion emitted highly radioactive materials into the environment. This overview recalls what really happened just after the Fukushima accident, especially during the early phase of chaos and the confusion of the Fukushima accident. The declining credibility of the Japanese governmental and official bodies just after the complex disasters may worsen the difficult situation of radiation fear and anxiety. The Fukushima accident have also severely shattered public faith in the academic societies and international regulatory bodies far beyond our preparation and exercise for a future nuclear accident. Therefore, it is important to regain public trust <laughs> and narrow the gaps in knowledge between the experts and the public, especially on the stochastic effect of low dose radiation exposure, where a large uncertainty exists, and on public health emergency and wide radio contamination areas from the nuclear disasters, which possess a real problem. Indeed, it was really difficult to realize the balance of risk and benefit, and even the trade off concept of various risks for our health status just after the This slide shows the result of radio contamination map session 134 and 37 focusing mainly in Fukushima prefecture in November 2011. During the first year after the accident, many people such as firemen, policemen, self-defense team, officers, workers, 
and even our colleagues from the WHO Rempan in Japan have considerably contributed to the initial assistance of evacuation and health care and radiation dose evaluation until now the wide ranged radiation risk management for the residents in Fukushima. Especially, Fukushima Medical University plays a central role in collaboration with other organizations and universities on the, those estimates and health care program as this Fukushima Health Management Survey, which details will be introduced by Professor Kamiya next after the ANSCIA 2020 Fukushima report. of the Fukushima disaster, we were facing many difficulties of following several evacuation orders and also evacuated people themselves how to keep and manage their physical and mental conditions safely and peacefully. As shown in this slide, total 113,000 local residents were forced to be evacuated, and the number of peak of evacuees was 164,000, including many spontaneous evacuees from Fukushima. Surprisingly, not only <coughs> evacuation related to death, but also later disaster related death numbers are reported to be more than 2,000 among 4,000 closely associated with dramatic change of their life and behaviors. In January 2021, 20, there are still about 36,000 evacuees in and out from Fukushima. This evidence itself is a big scene and aftermath of Fukushima accident. And so we should always bear in mind that more profound attention when preparing and responding a nuclear accident should be paid and deliberation practiced to involve all stakeholders who can collaborate and cooperate in establishing comprehensive health risk management, especially for the evacuees. The issues newly challenged in Japan include emergency evacuation planning, interaction with the residents, health and environmental monitoring, the policies of re-entry and disaster recovery, radiation protection principle, and risk communication, including psychosocial issues in the community and societal resilience. Later in this symposium, the challenge of community recovery and human resource development in Fukushima will be actively presented. As one of the education challenge is as shown in the lower half of this slide, a newly established joint school from Nagasaki University and Fukushima Medical University is now producing human resources in academic, more practical fields of radiation emergency, medicine and nursing in Japan after the Fukushima accident. Simultaneously, the radiation emergency medicine network system in Japan was reconstructed in 2015 as shown in five centers, which are also designated as the WHO Rempan centers in Japan. The Japan Nuclear Regulatory Authority revised the Nuclear Emergency Response Guideline and Nuclear Disaster Medical Care System was renewed on the national level. As of August 2015, there are four Nuclear Disaster Medical Care General Support Centers as shown in blue boxes and five Radiation Emergency Medicine Support Centers shown in red box and red outer edges. The National Institute of Radiological Science in IRS is currently positioned within the National Institutes of Quantum and Radiological Sciences and Technology, QST, is 
des designated as the core center, core advanced radiation emergency medical support centers. In Japan, there are now 50 nuclear emergency core hospitals and nine nuclear power plants are actively in operation. We should therefore carefully prepare not only for a single nuclear power plant accident, but also for the complex disasters predicting from minor incidents to severe accidents. In summary, the risk of radiation-associated health consequences in Fukushima is considerably low and negligible based on the estimated radiation doses individuals received during the accident, strengthened by the recent Anske Fukushima 2020 report. However, in the initial stage of chaos and confusion, well-prepared governance of protective measures for evacuation and sheltering are essentially needed with well-trained expert staff and radiation risk communicators to avoid and mitigate any unnecessary health and mental damage, especially evacuation-related death. A high prevalence of childhood and adolescent cell cancers in Fukushima is another important topic, although I do not have time to introduce, should be correctly understood, which will be presented later by Professor Kamiya. Anyway, Fukushima is different from Chernobyl at the standpoint of health consequences of radiation exposure. Finally, sound radiation risk education for and risk communication with the public as well as all the skateboarders is currently challenging during the recovery phase after the nuclear accident. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Professor Yamashita, for your uh, presentation, which gave us an overview of the accident and the early response. Um, next in our program is um, um, Dr. Gillian Hirth, who is the Deputy CEO of the Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency, ARPANZA, uh, and the head of the WHO Collaborating Center in ARPANZA in Yalambi, Australia. She is the chair of the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, UNSCAR, for the 66 and 67 sessions. UNSCAR is uh, actually in our field of work is the uh, Bible of, uh, let's say, for the current state of knowledge. UNSCAR prepares this authoritative uh, report summarizing current st state of knowledge, which is used when we develop uh, international safety standards, recommendations, guides, etc. So uh, Gillian will present uh, the latest report of UNSCARE, which is specifically focusing on uh, the 10 years uh, of research on Fukushima consequences. Dear Gillian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Janet, and good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and thank you to the WHO for inviting UNSCIA to be a part of this webinar and to present on the UNSCIA 2020 report and the implications of information published since the UNSCIA 2013 report. UNSCIA published its 2020 report on, Fukush on the Fukushima accident on the 9th of March just prior to the 10th anniversary of the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami that led to the Fukushima nuclear accident. In my presentation today, I will constrain my overview to the update on the doses and health effects and risks to the population. If you wish to find out more about some of the broader findings, please check out the UNSCIA website. The scope and purpose of the UNSCIA 2020 report was to summarise the current understanding based on information up to the end of 2019 and to consider the implications for the findings of the 2013 report. 
Seven different topical themes listed here were reviewed. The expert group with supporting task groups also validated and revised the estimates of doses to the public, including variability and uncertainty and their health implications. As I noted, I will focus on the three areas highlighted in green. Compared with the estimates in the UNSCARE 2013 report, the committee's revised estimates of average effective doses in the first year and shown here in the left on the left graph for infants, these were considerably lower by more than a factor of 10 for municipalities or prefectures with lower doses and up to about 40% lower for those with higher doses. For absorbed doses to the thyroid, the committee's revised estimates of average doses in the first year, again shown for infants in the graph on the right, are similarly much lower for municipalities or prefectures with lower doses, and up to about two times lower for those with higher doses. These reductions have been counterbalanced by modest increases in the UNSCARE 2020 report of doses from external exposure, resulting from the use of an improved and validated model based on the results of Japanese scientists. In the 10 years after the accident, effective doses increase by between two and three times from the first year doses and over a lifetime up to the age of 80 years by about four times. In 2021, the average annual effective doses have been estimated less than 0.5 millisievert in all non-evacuated municipalities in Fukushima Prefecture and below 0.1 millisievert elsewhere in Japan. In the evacuated communities where evacuation orders have been lifted, average annual effective doses in 2021 taking account of completed remediation work are generally less than one millisievert. So why are there these differences and improvements in the estimates of public exposure? In the UNSCARE 2020 report, we had much more information, an additional seven years of information. More extensive measurements of the radionuclides in the environment, and more measurements of radionuclides in people. This included data from extensive personal dosimetry campaigns in a number of municipalities to measure external doses for people and published assessments by Japanese and other researchers of doses to people from one or other exposure pathway. The differences also related to improved, more robust and re realistic models that were based on an improved source term with better information on the patterns of releases and movement in the environment, which was used together with improved atmospheric transport dispersion modeling to estimate the concentrations of radionuclides in air. A new empirical and validated model was also developed to estimate external, external doses from radionuclides deposited on the ground based on extensive measurements of dose rate in Japanese conditions and also taking into account soil types and climate. There were also other Japanese specific information available that enabled improvements to earlier estimates, including a biokinetic model for radioiodine in, hum in the human body, which was developed specific to the Japanese population. There was greater realism that was able to be incorporated into modeling to take account of Japanese specific information, such as air filtration inside buildings habits and behavior. Realistic estimates of doses from ingestion of food and drinking water based on better information about what members of the public actually bought and consumed. Overall, the committee's revised estimates of doses to the public and their associated uncertainties prov provide a more realistic assessment of the exposure of the public resulting from the Fukushima accident compared with the UNSCARE 2013 report. So now let us look at the evacuated populations. The estimated average adsorbed doses to the thyroid in the first year ranged from about two milligrays to about 30 milligrays, and can be seen here on the graph on this slide for infants. 
For adults, this range was about one to 15 milligrays. When comparing average thyroid doses in the first year, the current estimates are systematically lower than those in the UNSCEAR 2013 report by about a factor of two on average. And the evacuation itself averted absorbed doses to the thyroid of infants of up to about 500 milligray. For the estimated average effective doses to infants in the first year for the different evacuation groups, these ranged from about 0.2 to 8 millisieverts. Average effective doses to adult evacuees were less than 6 millisieverts in the first year after the accident. When comparing average effective doses in the first year, the current estimates are systematically lower than those in the UNSCEAR 2013 report by about a factor of two on average. These changes in the doses, again, are mainly the result of more realistic evacuation scenarios. And as with the public exposure, the improved source term and atmospheric transfer and dispersion modeling, which allowed for improved estimates of doses to evacuees, along with the increased availability of Japanese specific information, such as the concentrations of radionuclides in buildings, and the use of Japanese specific dose coefficients for the intake of radio iodine. For worker doses, there was, there was just under 25,000 on-site workers during the period March 2011 to October 2012. Delays in commencing thyroid monitoring increased the uncertainty in reported thyroid doses for a fraction of the workers. And since the 2013 report, there have been two re-evaluations re of reported doses to the workers. But even so, the general findings of the 2013 report remain valid. The 2020 report also reported on doses to off-site environmental remediation workers, of which there were about 77,000 um, during the period 2012 to 2016. The average cumulative dose received was about one millisievert, and the results confirmed that doses to remediation workers were small. With regard to the health effects to the general population of Fukushima Prefecture from radiation exposures, the findings of the 2020 report are generally consistent with the 2013 report findings, but there is now more information available to support these conclusions. Future discernible cancer excesses are unlikely in the sensitive groups exposed in childhood, given the generally low doses. Discernible excesses of thyroid cancer caused by the radiation exposure are unlikely up to the ages of 30 or 40 years or over the entire lifespan. The large number of diagnosed thyroid cancers were judged to be due to the ultra-sensitive thyroid screening and not attributable to radiation exposure. And adverse reproductive outcomes the study showed no discernible excess of birth defects, stillbirths, preterm births, low birth weight um, in the Japanese um, Fukushima prefecture population. Elevated prevalence of cardiovascular and metabolic conditions among evacuees were observed, but not the non-evacuees. And it's likely that these are from lifestyle changes and the psych psychosocial stresses not from the radiation exposure. These effects are examined in more detail by other organizations. For the health effects on emergency workers, there is little information on the health outcomes available to date, but future discernible increases in cancer rates are considered unlikely. Before I go into key lessons, I would first like to recall that UNSCEAR is an independent UN scientific committee and our mandate is to focus on the science and understanding of sources and exposures, health effects and mechanisms associated with radiation. As part of the process of putting together the 2020 report, the 2013 report and the white papers in between, the committee has noted many other important issues that are not part of its mandate. And these are in relation to the broader issues of the health and well-being and social impacts of the nuclear accident. These are all concerns and UNSCEAR is aware of them, but they are the remit of other organisations. With respect to key lessons for UNSCEAR, and these very much relate to our mandate of being able to realistically estimate doses to exposed persons, 
for the purpose of evaluating health risks to people and the environment. The committee stresses the importance of measurement data, especially in the early days of an accident. Measurement of radiation in people and the environment that is taken as soon as possible during and after an accident in order to make as realistic as possible dose estimates. In our 2013 report, there was a higher reliance on modelling data for certain population groups, and we know that this tends to make dose estimates more conservative. Finally, it is important to understand baseline rates of a cancer in a population and the sensitivity of screening techniques that may be applied to follow up and detect cancers in an exposed population. The 2020 report is an authoritative, independent and up-to-date assessment of the levels and effects of radiation exposure due to the Fukushima accident, based on the latest science and monitoring data to the end of 2019. The main findings are robust and are unlikely to change significantly in the foreseeable future. And finally, I would like to acknowledge all of the efforts of the experts, lead writers and the staff of the Secretariat who have been involved in this project over the last two and a half years, and in particular, the coordinating lead writer and the task group leaders for their tireless efforts and commitment to this project, and to all the organisations that provided data to support this assessment, and the scientific community and researchers in Japan and abroad for their efforts and their publications. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Excellent report. Uh, really remarkable work of uh, international experts um, putting um, a, a very, very uh, strong message uh, to the global community. Thank you so much. I would like to remind the participants we have some 150 people connected listening and about 300 people registered for the webinar. I would like to remind you that if you like to ask panelists a question, there is a Q&A um, function at the bottom of your screen where you can type your question and uh, one and please indicate to which panelist the question is directed. So we will be able to answer it through this uh, little functionality. Um, next in our program is uh, uh, Professor Kenji Kamiya, who is the director of the Radiation Medical Science Center for the Fukushima Health Management Survey at the Fukushima Medical University. Fukushima Medical University is also our collaborating center. Um, Professor Kami is also vice president of both Hiroshima University and Fukushima Medical University. Professor Kami presented his uh, pre-recorded presentation and I'm going to quickly open it and share my screen just a second. Share screen, share sound, share screen. Here we go, make it full screen and play. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to present the results of Fukushima Health Management Survey for 10 years after Fukushima nuclear accident. The survey is being conducted by the Radiation Medical Science Center for the Fukushima Health Management Survey, Fukushima Medical University, as the project commissioned by Fukushima Prefecture. My name is Kenji Kamiya. I am serving as the director of this center. This slide shows the evacuation area. The evacuation area was expanded from kilos, 3 kilometers in radius to 20 kilometers in radius over time. Furthermore, additional evacuation areas as were designated outside the 20 kilometer radius. As a result, more than 113,000 people are forced to evacuate. This slide shows the outline of the Fukushima Health Management Survey. The survey consists of two frames. One is basic survey and the other is a detailed survey. The purpose of basic survey is to estimate the external exposure dose of resident. The purpose of the detailed survey is to estimate the health status of resident. 
detailed survey consists of four surveys, such as thyroid examination, comprehensive health check, mental health and lifestyle survey, pregnancy and birth survey. This slide shows the result of the basic survey. The, this survey estimates the external exposure effective dose of over 460,000 residents during the first four months after the accident. The result shows that the exposure dose of 99.8% of residents was less than 5 mSv and 93.8% of residents was less than 2 mSv. The highest value was 25 mSv, average 0.8 mSv, median 0.6 mSv. This slide shows the results of thyroid examination for over 300,000 children aged 18 years or younger. This column shows the result of the first examination. The next column shows the result of second, the third, and fourth examination, respectively. These red numbers indicate the number of children with thyroid cancer or suspected malignancy found in each test. In the first examination, thyroid cancer or suspected malignancy was found in 160 children, and in the second exam, 71 children. This slide shows the thyroid doses from Chernobyl and Fukushima accident according to the unscale. In the Chernobyl accident, a high mean sided dose ranging from 330 to 1100 milligray was estimated in three countries. In contrast, the highest sided dose from the Fukushima accident was estimated in one year old children. The value was 2.2 to 30 milligray. The thyroid dose of Fukushima can be said to be far lower than that of Chernobyl. This slide shows the adjusted odds ratio for thyroid cancer risk among 6 to 14 years old children according to thyroid doses. In order to analyze the relationship between thyroid dose and cancer development, we used absorbed dose of thyroid gland estimated by unscale. Results indicated that there is no increase in the adjusted odds ratio of cancer risk with the increase of thyroid doses from either the first examination or the second examination. This slide shows a comparison of the age distribution in the cases of Chernobyl and Fukushima thyroid cancer. In the case of the Chernobyl accident reported by Dr. Tronco, thyroid cancers were frequently observed among 0 to 4 years old children in the period of 5 to 8 years after the accident. On the other hand, in Fukushima, thyroid cancer has not been found 0 to 4 years old children during 7 years after the accident. These data indicate that the age distribution of thyroid cancer found in Fukushima is very different from that in Chernobyl. Based on these evidences, the Prefectural Oversight Committee evaluated the results of 
the first and second examination and concluded that silent cancers found in these two examinations cannot be considered to have any causation from radiation exposure. Thyroid examination has its advantages and disadvantages. In order to perform a thyroid examination, it is important for doctors to perform the examination only to those who want the examination after understanding its advantages and disadvantages. Next, I'll talk about the comprehensive health check. The target population of this survey is about 210,000 residents in 13 municipalities designated as evacuation zones. The slide shows the influence of evacuation life on onset of obesity, hypertension, lipid abnormality, diabetes after the Great East Japan earthquake. There is a significant increase in the hazard ratio of these diseases among evacuees after the accident. This slide shows the summary of the results from comprehensive health check. This examination reveals that an increasing proportion of these diseases were observed among evacuees. These results indicate that life changes due to evacuation can be considered as a risk factor. Next, I'll talk about the mental health and lifestyle survey. The target population is the same as that of the comprehensive health check. This slide shows a result of general mental health conditions measured by K6 test. Residents with K6 score of 13 or higher are considered to need some mental support, and the proportion of this K6 score in general population of Japan is 3%. A high proportion of people at risk for mental health problems measured by K6 was observed in 2011, but decreased in every year thereafter. However, the proportion in seven years after the accident is still about two times higher than that of general population of Japan. Finally, I'll talk about the pregnancy and birth survey. The target population here are about 15,000 pregnant women each year. This slide shows the rates of preterm deliveries, rates of low birth weight infant, and rates of congenital anomalies. As you can see, in preterm deliveries, there are no significant differences between Fukushima data and the national average. Similarly, there are no significant differences in the rate of low birth weight infant and rate of congenital anomalies compared to the average of Japanese. Radiation disasters have a wide-ranging impact on health society and the environment. The health impact is not only directly correlated with the radiation doses, but is also due to the sudden changes in lifestyle, especially in case of evacuation. Therefore, it is important to take into consideration not only the exposure doses, but all the various factors that affect human health. In this situation, Fukushima Health Management Survey plays 
very important role for Fukushima health surveillance and promotion among Fukushima residents. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Camilla, for this wonderful overview of the tremendous efforts which are being carried out by uh, Fukushima Medical University. Um, next in our program is um, a presentation from Dr. Hiroko Kitamura. She uh, is a senior scientist at the Occupational Health Training Center, University of Occupation and Environmental Health in uh, uh, Kitakura. Kuyushu City in Fukuoka Prefecture in Japan. Uh, Hiroko, she uh, also provided, uh, uh, Hiroko provided the pre-recorded uh, presentation. So I'm happy to put it on immediately. And to share my screen. screen with sound. Here we go. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to make a presentation here today. Firstly, please let me introduce myself. My name is Hiroko Kitamura, Associate Professor of the Occupational Health Training Center University of Occupational and Environmental Health, Japan. I belonged to the Radiation Effects Research Foundation until March 2020, and I was involved in the epidemiological study of health effects in Fukushima emergency workers. Today, I'd like to talk about the summary of the baseline survey of the epidemiological study of health effects in Fukushima emergency workers from 2016 to 2019 on behalf of Dr. Okubo, who is the principal investigator of this study. To begin with, let's address our view of the study. As you know, the Great East Japan earthquake caused a huge tsunami and the Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Plant of Tokyo Electric Power Company suffered major damage. Some of the Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Plant reactors lost the power supply and could not be cooled. As a result, core meltdown occurred and a serious nuclear accident with a leakage of radioactive materials was developed. Many individuals from all over Japan gathered at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant to engage in the emergency operations. These included civil servants such as self-defense forces personnel, police officers, and firefighters, as well as civilians such as employees of TEPCO, TEPCO group companies, contractors, and subcontractors, and day laborers. The subjects of our study are civilians. The objective of the study is to clarify the long-term health effects of radiation on the emergency workers. The subjects are 19,808 nuclear emergency workers who are engaged in the emergency operations after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident between the 14th of March and the 16th of December 2011, the period when the dose limit for emergency workers was raised from 100 millisieverts to 250 millisieverts by the Japanese government. This is a prospective cohort study and will be continued over the course of lifetime of the subjects. This slide shows implementation plan and the components of the baseline survey. We got the first health examination as a baseline survey and planned to conduct a longitudinal survey once every five years after the baseline survey. Baseline survey consists of physical measurement, blood pressure measurement, electrocardiography, laboratory test, chest X-ray examination, abdominal ultrasonography, questionnaire for health and lifestyle, and preservation of biological samples. Move on to the next part. I'd like to talk about the results of the baseline survey 
between 2016 to 2019. This slide shows the characteristics of the baseline survey participants. Total of the baseline survey participants were 5,718 individuals with 99.8% males and only 0.2% females. Mean age at health examination was 51.6 years old. Those in their 50s accounted for 32.1% and those in their 40s accounted for 28.8%. This study showed the exposed doses of the baseline survey participants. In our study, individual doses are being reconstructed, but here tentative doses provided by Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare are used. Mean cumulative effective dose during emergency operations was 15.4 mSv. 24.1% of the participants have cumulative dose 1 to 5 mSv, and 23.4% of the participants have cumulative dose less than 1 mSv. I will show the results of each tested items. The mean BMI of the baseline survey participants were 24.4, and individuals determined as obesity with BMI equal to or more 25 accounted to 38.3%. Regarding blood pressure, systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure were determined to be hypertension in 15.8% and 16.5% of the baseline survey participants, respectively. For about laboratory test, none of the mean value of tested items deviated from the reference interval of Japanese Committee for Clinical Laboratory Standards. This slide shows the results of electrocardiography, chest X-ray examination, and abdominal ultrasonography. 71% of the baseline survey participants were judged as normal or near normal in electrocardiography, and the common findings were sinus bradycardia, left ventricular high potential, and left axis deviation. For about chest X-ray examination, 79.8% were judged as normal or near normal, and the common findings were prior thickness, prior adhesion, bura, and infiltration. For about abdominal ultrasonography, 23.4% were judged as normal or near normal, and the common findings were fatty liver, renal cyst, and gallbladder polyp. This slide shows smoking and drinking habits of baseline survey participants. Regarding smoking habit, current smokers were accounted for 34.6%, personal smokers accounted for 38.9%, and non-smokers accounted for 26.5%. As for drinking habit, there were 84.2% of participants drinking at least once a month regularly. Let's move on to the next part. According to the National Health and Nutrition Survey, the proportion of obese adult males has been around 30% for the past 10 years. Compared with Japanese adult males, the proportion of obese people was higher among those who underwent the baseline survey. To enhance health guidance for weight loss after the health examination was considered necessary. The National Health and Nutrition Survey showed that the proportion of male current smokers was about 30%, and the proportion of current smokers in the baseline survey was slightly higher. It was considered useful to provide information on smoking cessation. Based on the results of the comprehensive survey of living conditions, 42.1% of adult males were found to drink alcohol regularly at least once a month. The proportion of those who have a drinking habit in the baseline survey was much higher. Careful observation was considered necessary for 
for the onset of diseases known to be affected by alcohol consumption, including lifestyle-related diseases and cancer. Finally, the conclusion. Other characteristics of the baseline survey participants, there were no items whose mean values were out of the reference intervals. But compared to Japanese adult males, there were more obese people, current smokers, and individuals with regularly drinking habits. Diseases in which obesity, smoking, and drinking may be associated with onset or confounders should be carefully considered in future studies. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Hiroko, for your presentation. We move on with the program. I can see that in the Q&A, we have some questions to the panelists. Um, I will appreciate if panelists will um, take a look at the Q&As and respond to questions directed to them. So next in our program is our um, good friend of uh, WHO radiation program, one of our champions, one of the most efficient and productive colleagues, uh, Professor Noboru Takamura. He is a professor and head of the Department of Global Health, Medicine and Welfare, Atomic Bomb Disease Institute of the Nagasaki University, and he is the head of the WHO Collaborating Center. Dear Noboru, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you, Janet. So today, my, I will talk about the 10 years of community efforts for the recovery from the nuclear disaster in Fukushima. So firstly, uh, in, since 2011, so we started the recovery efforts of Kawauchi village. Kawauchi village is firstly decided to return to their hometown after the evacuation just after the accident. So based on the evaluation of the exposure dose of residents, we, uh, we communicated with residents about the radiation exposure and health effect in Kawauchi village. So this uh, slide shows the rate of return or uh, recovery situation of each municipality around Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. As you see, Kawauchi village, almost 80 percentage of residents return back. And the situation of Kawauchi is almost reaching to the normal situation. On the other hand, next, uh, secondary, we established the satellite office in Tomioka town but the rate of return is still almost 10 percentages. And then last year, we established a satellite office in Okuma town, but the number of the return resident in Okuma town is very limited, just the began, beginning of the recovery. On the other hand, as you see in Futaba town, where the nuclear power plant installed, no resident return back yet. So of course, we continue the support of the recovery efforts of Kawauchi village, but simultaneously, we uh, actively uh, have a seminar or training course in Kawauchi village to share the experiences of the recovery efforts after the nuclear disaster of Kawauchi village. So last year, we had the so-called online seminar on the stakeholder engagement for recover uh, recovery after the nuclear disaster at Kawauchi Village. And then, uh, fortunately, uh, more than uh, 120 student experts participated in the course. And then many Lempan colleagues actually participated in the course in, in this uh, seminar, and then the, also the debriefing session. Thank you very much for your active participation. And then next, I, we, uh, established the satellite office of the uh, at the Tomioka town, and then, as I mentioned, in Tomioka town, uh, since the 2017, the recovery effort started, but only 10 percentage of residents uh, re return back to the town. And then also, they still have diff difficult to return zone in Tomioka town, but. Uh, Japanese government and Tomioka town started the decontam decontamination in, the, in this difficult to return zone partially. 
And then our university is regularly uh, doing so-called carbon survey to evaluate the effectiveness of the decontamination in this area. As you see in the left panel, at the decontaminated area, the level of ambient doses is decreasing compared to the other non-decontaminated area. Based on such kind of the data information, it means the exposure dose, expected exposure doses of resident, we are doing the risk communication at first to the resident living in Tomioka town, it means that already returned back. And then also we are doing the risk communication in the resident outside Tomioka who has not decided to their hometown yet. So approaching to this kind of resident who has not decided to return back to their hometown is very, very important. Also, we uh, established the third uh, satellite office in Okuma town. In Okuma town, has the Okuma town has a Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant and then they started their return to the town from 2019. And then we established the satellite office in 2020. Similar with the other two satellite office, we are doing the evaluation of the exposure doses of resident. And then based on the measured data, we are doing the risk communication with residents. So this is a map of the Okuma town. Green and the yellow zone are the evacuation lifted area in 2019. But the number of the population who are living before the accident in this area is still limited. Almost all residents were living in, was living in the difficult to return zone. So that's why, so the number of residents who return to Okuma town is quite limited, only 200 of 10,000 residents. So same with the Tomioka town. At first, we started the list communication to the resident who already returned back to Okuma town. So this is the questions from the residents. So many of the residents still have the anxiety for drinking tap water in Tomioka, uh, in Okuma town. And then some of the residents uh, have anxiety about the treating water in power plant. As you know that the, uh, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant is located in the Okuma town. So that's why they have a higher anxiety about the, such a treating water. So it is very important to implement the list communication with residents who already returned back to Tomio, uh, Okuma so that they feel satisfied their life in their hometown. And simultaneously, we are doing the list communication to the resident of, of Okuma town who evacuate, still evacuate to other areas. Many of the residents have still hesitating, still wondering to, uh, to return to Okuma town. So similar with the uh, Tomioka town cases, so approaching to the resident, such resident is very important. The last year in Futaba town, the Great East, uh, <clears throat> the Great East Earthquake, uh, Japan Earthquake and Nuclear Disaster Memorial Museum has opened in Futaba town to, uh, to collect the archives of the complex disaster, and also to share the experience of the uh, experiences of such kind of the complex disaster, not only in Japan, but also in the worldwide. So I became the first director of this museum last year. Then in cooperation with this museum, 
we are doing also the list communication with residents. So we invite the residents of Tomioka and Okuma to this museum. And then after the excursion inside the museum, we have the list communication with the resident. Such kind of the combination between the such a uh, risk communication and other events are currently very important because only risk communication, so sometimes residents hesitate to participate in. So this is my last slide. Already 10 years has passed since the accident. As I mentioned, Kawaji Village already terminated the recovery efforts and then return, uh, leads to the normal period. But in Okuma, uh, in Tomioka town, for Tomioka town, recovery effort is ongoing. And then for Okuma town, recovery effort has just started. In Futaba town, recovery effort have not started yet. So after the 10 years of the accident, the sort of recovery phase in each municipality is different. So we need to notice this kind of the situation to implement the effective risk communication for the recovery of the community. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Takamura. Excellent presentation, really impressive work with affected communities. We always advocate for engaging with affected people, with bringing them uh, into the decision-making process and involving them at all levels. So you are really setting an example with what you are doing there. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, just want to remind again to our panelists that there are some questions, interesting questions in Q&A. Please uh, take a look. Um, I know that uh, uh, Dr. Hiroko uh, Kitamura uh, may not be able to answer, but uh, Professor Kazinori Kodama would be able to look at the question related to the uh, TEPCO workers. Um, without further delay, I'm switching to the next presentation from um, Professor Michio Murakami, who is uh, a professor at the Department of Health Risk Communication at the Fukushima Medical University School of Medicine. Um, Michio will be talking about one of the most important components in dealing with the consequences uh, of radiological nuclear emergencies, which is risk communication. It is difficult task and he will tell us, uh, share the experience of Fukushima with this. Uh, you want me to show pre-recorded presentation, don't you, right? I think- we Yeah, could you please yes. use uh, my slide? Yes, okay, I'm sharing the screen. Thank you. Sharing sound, sharing screen, uh, making it full screen. Okay, we start. This is Michio Murakami from Fukushima Medical University. I am pleased to have a presentation in WHO webinar today. I would like to talk about risk communication as community aligned science after the Fukushima disaster. As you all know, the latest UNSCAR report has been up and released on March 9. This slide shows the comparison of satellite doses in the 2013 and 2020 UNSCAR reports. You can see that the thyroid doses has decreased significantly due to the uh, uh, recalculation. This report highlighted that there would be no discernible increase in heritage effect and cancer, including leukemia, thyroid cancer, breast cancer, and all three cancers. Similar views were reported in other international organizations, including WHO and IAEA. Such objective and unbiased scientific evaluation is also very important in terms of post-disaster reconstruction and policies to promote it. According to the words of a recent drafted editorial, the scientific findings obtained are indeed a powerful and positive force in society, shaping the present and guiding the future, and politicians and policy makers have relied on these scientific findings to act. Actually, radiation doses and health risk assessment conducted after the Fukushima disaster in 2011 have played important roles in the recovery in the affected areas. 
For example, regarding radiation dose finding, have been used to implement several measures including fluid shipment restriction, decontamination, evacuation, and return policies. Health survey has been also conducted to monitor physical and mental health among the affected people. In case of occupational health management survey, based on the result of the survey, measures have been taken to support high-risk groups and to promote health in the population. In the decades since the Fukushima accident, however, several crises have shaken the confidence in science. First, there has been the clash between science and policy, science and politics. That time, government side researcher was used to divide the discussion of scientific findings among scientists and often among scientists and citizens. And especially the uh, uh, scientists who tried to actively uh, disseminate their findings were attacked or branded. Second, and some scientific papers have been ramp rampant. I do not mention details, however, the, some epidemiological papers pointing out the possibility of genetic health effects or increased incidence of cell cancer due to radiation exposure have been published, while uh, subsequent letters, papers, and unscared reports have pointed out the flaws in the, those papers. Typical features of these uh, prematurely published scientific papers are ignorance of previous findings on possible radiation health effects based on existing and established doses, and unreasonable research assumption due to lack of understanding of detailed testing and research methods. However, importantly, concerns arose that the paper containing these inadequacy have been uh, disseminated through the media and social network insights, resulting in further social psychological burdens such as distress, stigma, and discrimination against the affected people. While it is appropriate for the process of science to be generally conducting a free spirit of science for science's sake, with debate and inquiry determined accordingly, in disaster scenario, Additional sensitivity is called for to prevent the persist of science from causing further harm to the people affected by the disaster. Third, uh, there have been the occurrence of research pollution. In the aftermath of disaster, the lines between public health activities and research activities blur, and traditional research and scientific framework often become incompatible in in with local recovery frameworks. Post disaster research itself sometimes spread into the affected community with a negative impact. In the case of the Fukushima disaster, for example, the large number of cases has been has imposed an additional uh, psychological burden on, on those affected. Moreover, the objective and findings of survey and research were not always fully shared with the affected people who cooperated in the surveys. So uh, for example, the reflecting such situations, the Fukushima Health Management Survey not only provides support to high risk groups, but now provides a feedback of result uh, to the, those who responded to the survey. And also, I and my colleague have been sh sharing the purpose and research of our own study. Thus, our major lesson is that the role of science in the aftermath of disaster need to be resolved. Post-disaster science need to bring the community into the discussion with a clear sense of community aligned science. In community aligned science, there are three key points. First is uh, outreach system. Careful and close uh, act activity will help dis disseminate scientific knowledge and lead to collaboration. For example, it is possible to outreach the system through uh, liaison and uh, delivery of finding to health professional. Second is to prioritize issues. Among various health issues after the disaster, the cross activity provides opportunity to learn what issue people perceive to be important. Third is gaining trust in science. By sharing the values, trust in science will be generated, which will lead to collaboration in solving issues. 
I would like to introduce two examples. First is visiting lecture for public health nurses. After the disaster, I and my colleague have conducted on-site lecture for public health nurses in cooperation with the framework of in-service education in Fukushima Prefecture with the aim of imparting knowledge and skills necessary for health activities. We do not have a one-sided uh, one approach here. We prepare a set of uh, 10 to 30 lectures that we think are important for the field, and the health and welfare office select the classes based on the issue and the needs of the field. By developing a class in this way, the public health nurses who learn the finding can apply them to their health activity in the field. Furthermore, we evaluate the effect of lectures scientifically. This is an aspect of our research. For example, we found that people who participated in health literacy lectures received more positive feedback from residents. In this way, we keep both research and community activity in the loop. The second example is the evacuation host interaction activity. In this activity, we perform door-to-door -door survey to understand status of interaction between evacuate host and psychological distress. In York City. Initially, this aimed to use an on site lecture for the public health nurses. When we visited the committee chairperson before the survey, he said, This one to this might be 0 10%. Through many visits, relationships and trust were developed. And the survey was also brushed up and informed. We then achieved approximately 50% of this month rate. I do not. Uh, intend to talk about the high recovery rate itself, but the fact that we build trust by building a relationship and uh, taking steps like this. That's important. We then performed many uh, seminars at every outreach program for public health nurses as scheduled. Public health nurses who, who receive the lectures on the finding of this survey can apply them in the field. We also feed back to the participants of the uh, survey to share the result. By doing it this way, a collaborative activity within the community has started. Workshops were held with relevant organizations to identify issues uh, faced by evacuee, resulting in the strength in the cooperation among related organizations and proposing scientific plans for health seminars. Furthermore, we also published our activities themselves as papers. Through these processes, the feedback and collaborative activities can be shared as academic knowledge. This is the final slide. Summarizing the five components of community aligned science. First is norm for scientists. In addition to academic correctness, post disaster science should focus on the legitimacy of its argument to the community and the dignity of the affected people. Scientists need to recognize this as norm. Secondly, discussion of barriers. It will be necessary to discuss barriers such as what kind of research and survey should be carried out in the aftermath of disaster with scientists, government, and affected people working together. Third is sharing findings. It is beneficial to share the result of research and survey conducted in this way with members of society, including the affected people. Fourth is collaborative activity with stakeholders. Sharing the objective and result of research will help to promote collaborative activity for post-disaster recovery and move society forward. Collaborative activity among stakeholders, including the general public, will work to identify new research topics and shift the focus of the research. Fifth is the academic evaluation. Scientific journal and academic society should provide a framework for academic evaluation of these collaborative activities and sharing of their knowledge, just as the clinical cases are shared in the form of the case reports. This framework will encourage the next generation of researchers and advance society and science. The community alliance approach will continue to broaden as scientists practice science or society by integrating the people affected by disaster into science itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michio. Excellent presentation. I hope uh, that uh, we are doing okay with time. I can see that we uh, still uh, have questions coming up. There are open 10 questions, but when I share my screen, because I'm the moderator of the event, unfortunately I cannot get into Q&A session. So uh, this is up to you panelists. Please take a look and respond to as many as you can questions 
um, in that uh, function. Um, okay, so further on in our program, we have uh, Professor uh, Nobuyuki Hirohashi from uh, the, he's a professor at the Department of Radiation Disaster Medicine of the Research Institute for Radiation Biology and Medicine in Hiroshima University, uh, in, in Hiroshima, uh, Japan. Uh, Hiroshima University is a liaison institute of the Rampan network. They are not uh, a yet a collaborating center, but they're very active member supporting our work. And uh, we are very happy to have Professor Hirohashi um, on board for this webinar. He also sent us a pre-recorded presentation, which now I'm pulling up on my screen immediately. And I will be sharing my screen. Just a second. Um, bear with me a few seconds. Share screen, share sound, share screen. Here we go. Voila. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk in this Fukushima session. I'm Nobuki Hirohashi from Hiroshima University. I will talk about human resource development after the Fukushima accident, including graduate education. I will talk about the current situation and issues in the area of human resource development that, that I am personally involved in, namely radiation emergency medical system, nuclear disaster training, and medical education. We have learned a lot of the lessons from the past and have built a new medical system, the radiation emergency medical care system from the Tokaimura criticality accident, and radiation disaster medical system from the complex disaster, including radiation from Fukushima. Based on the lessons learned from Fukushima, we are now establishing a system that can accept any injured or sick patient. Nuclear Emergency Core Hospital has a central role for the complex disasters, including radiation disasters. And two support centers have been designed to assist these hospitals. These two centers have their own roles, but five facilities have been set up in each region of Japan. And Hiroshima University has been designed as one of the five facilities. So we, Hiroshima University, has been in charge of 12 prefectures and we have been visiting nuclear emergency core hospitals in each prefecture to provide training for the nuclear disaster medical dispatch teams. And we also have a training course of the radiation disaster medicine for core medical staffs as advanced radiation emergency support center. We have been conducting this training since the radiation disaster medical system built in 2015, but we have found various issues that need to be improved. Therefore, the Nuclear Regulation Authority has decided to start a new training system this spring. In this year, the training system starts with a basic course and progresses upward, and the course history is registered. By this way, we can keep the track of who has the skills, what kind of skills they have. If a disaster occurred, we will be able to use these records to coordinate the dispatch of personnel. So I'm going to change the subject and I will talk about our human resource development efforts. In addition to lectures on basic radiation medicine, which is necessary for the medical student, we offer such a unique program in Hiroshima University in the second grade of the DH medical student. We believe that this RE exposure will stimulate their interest in radiation and radiation disaster. The fifth grade medical students are required to the practice emergency disaster medicine as part of the, their clinical training. However, it's difficult to spend a long time. I heard the Fukushima Medical University takes a four days to practice. That's wonderful. Uh, we give lectures and training not only to the medical students, but also to people from the various field. The Graduate School of Biomedical and Health Sciences, Hiroshima University, offers this more in-depth and deep education to its students. All instructors for this course are professors of Research Institute for Radiation Biology and Medicine. Nuclear accident cause not only health effects, 
but also serious damage to society and the environment. Therefore, in order to guide the reconstruction process after a nuclear accident, it is necessary for leaders to have cross-disciplinary skills and knowledge in multiple fields, such as the social science and the environmental science, as well as medical science. We need to foster the human resources who can demonstrate it global leadership from a bird's eye perspective with multidisciplinary academic background. So Phoenix Leader Education Program was established in Hiroshima University after a Fukushima accident. The program has three educational courses. All students complete the common core education subjects in their first and the second year. And then, after passing the qualified examination, they conduct academic research for the PhD dissertation. They also complete either a fieldwork or an internship program in order to gain specialized practical skills. The Phoenix Data Education Program contains the educational contents from the multidisciplinary approach to transdisciplinary approach. From lessons from the Fukushima, we need not only multidisciplinary approach, but also transdisciplinary approach. This program received great support from universities, research institutions, administrative agencies, and domestic companies, and many other organizations in Japan. Our primary ambition is to build a human resource development system, a network for construction from radiation disaster across the globe, which will be able to ensure the security and safety of our world. We are doing this with the tremendous support of our partners who are described on this slide. We are currently developing this network into a more functional framework with the capability to organize cross-border educational and research opportunities for students and professionals as well as internship, collaborative research project, and on-site training. I'll show you that the numbers of enrolled students in this program and completed the PhD course. The program is characterized by a large number of students enrolled from overseas, especially from Asia. A new laboratory building was completed this spring we will continue to make effective use of this facility to further develop our human resources in radiation disaster. So we have a wonderful educational environment, but uh, we have the questions. Will many young leaders of radiation emergency medicine grow up in such a wonderful educational environment? I think that the current human resource development in radiation disaster medicine especially medical staff in Japan, is still not enough. We are so sorry that young doctors is not coming to our field because radiation disaster occur only rarely and opportunities to demonstrate their skills are hard to come by. And still, radiation disaster medicine is not recognized as a subspecialty of emergency or disaster medicine. On the other hand, this normalcy bias may dilute the perception of radiation disaster medicine. The transdisciplinary team approach as well as multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary team approach is clearly necessary for not only acute radiation syndrome, but also complex disasters involving radiation disasters. We must continue to educate the medical staffs involved in basic medical science and clinical disaster medicine so that they will be interested in and involved in radiation disaster medicine. There are many studies being conducted in our facility that will be lead to radiation disaster medicine. Of course, we must further strengthen the collaboration between the Fukushima Medical University and Nagasaki University in terms of human resource development with radiation disaster medical science as the keyword. So Japan's disaster medical system for their natural disasters is currently advanced and well developed. 
We hope that we will be able to adapt this well-developed human resource to radiation disasters as well. The human resource development should be promoted across the professions, regions, and even countries. It is important to continue it steadily and persistently based on our own real-life experience and lessons learned from Fukushima. Our country has not yet done enough to develop human resources to deal with radiation disasters, and we will always keep this thing from 70, 60 years ago in mind as we will strive to develop human resources for next radiation disaster. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Hirohashi. Uh, truly impressive efforts are ongoing in uh, your university with uh, preparing the uh, workforce and training and research. It's really impressive. Um, our next speaker in the program is, uh, Professor, is uh, uh, Dr. Tomisato Miura from the Department of Risk Analysis and Biodosimetry of the Institute of Radiation Emergency Medicine in Hirosaki University, which is Aomori Prefecture in the very north of Japan. Uh, Hirosaki uh, University, this center is responsible for medical assistance uh, for all nuclear installations in the north of Japan. So Tomisato, the floor is yours. You will share your own slides, I understand. We cannot hear you. There is no sound. Tomisato, you, I, we cannot hear you. No sound. Okay, I think I have your presentation. I, if you like, no, yes. Do you want me to share your presentation? We cannot hear you, unfortunately. Tomisato, you are muted or there is a problem with your sound. Okay, Professor Miura, we cannot hear you. There is no sound. I will share my screen. I will show your presentation, okay? And if there are questions, uh, you will uh, look in the Q&A function and you will be able to answer the questions there. For now, I start sharing my screen and will uh, show your presentation. It's a good thing that we prepared and have done this in advance. Hirosaki University has been conducting the construction support activities for Namiyatan since the Great East Japan earthquake. Today, I would like to introduce our activities. Namiyatan faces the Pacific Ocean and it located north of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. On September 29th in 2011, Hirosaki University and Namiya Town signed a comprehensive agreement. This photo shows the signing of Hirosaki University president and Namiya mayor. On October 14th, Hirosaki University has organized the Namiya Town Reconstruction Assistance Working Group. Then, December 1st, we proposed three activities to support the construction of Namiya Town. The first is recovery of Namiya Town. The second is security and safety for residents. And the third is accumulation of scientific findings. In 2011, our activity base was not established in Namiya Town. Then we have to collect animal sample in the car. On August 1st, in 2012, support facilities established in Tsushima District, Namiya Town. By using these support facilities, we have become able to carry out various research activities. On July 1st, 2013, 
the headquarters office was installed in Namie Town Hall. On January 22, in 2014, radiation protection and healthcare training for town officers has begun. On February 8, 2015, seminar for residents was held, and on January 22, in 2016, activity report of the Namie Town Destruction Assistance Working Group was submitted to Namie Town Hall. Next, I will introduce various of our activities. The first topic is those estimation for residents in Namie Town. A fact that is often ignored by the general public is that people who are exposed to natural radiation source before the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident, and that such exposure continue on a diary basis. That why natural radiation and radionuclear dye measures in Namie Town is important. Finally, we will use these results for the radiation risk communication to the residents in Namie Town. We hope that the resident may understand the radiation dose caused by the accident by comparing with the dose from national radiation. The second topic is the studies of biological effects of radiation exposure and the dynamics of radioactive materials. In the animal studies, we analyze chromosome aberration in wild animals and internal contamination analysis in free roaming cat and the freshwater fish. In addition, we have published a guidebook on countermeasure against infectious disease derived from animals that have increased in the urban area during the period of prolonged evacuation resident. We also analyzed and reported on chromosome translocation in more than 700 children under the age of 19 to reduce anxiety about the health hazard of the inhabitant. We analyzed the environmental sample at Rukid River flowing through highly contaminated region in Namie Town and collected freshwater fishes and clams. Strontium 90 and sodium 137 have decreased with ecological half lives of three years. Before 2012, sodium 137 concentration in river water was reported to be very high. However, there is no data immediately after the accident. River water monitoring in Fukushima has been started from June in 2011. First three months leave the unknown period. Share of crown gradually grow up by acceleration and form a growth ring like a tree wings. The growth ring records information for surrounding aquatic environment. We focus on the reconstruct sesium 137 concentration using process analysis for strontium 90 and iodine 129 in the growth ring. In addition to the activities mentioned above, Health consultation and risk communication work for staffs in Namie Town Office had been held to their health support and residents care about radiation risk since 2013. We held uh, eight times every year and 160 staffs have been consulted by us. The content of consultation are not only physical symptoms, but about mental health and their family. Furthermore, Poka Poka Terrace was organized by Namie Machi Certified Children's Center and the Board of Education in Namie Town. It is a regular event that mother and their child gather 
children gather in Namia town. We received a consultation about children's teeth conditions and performed aromatherapy. Seven pairs participate. They really enjoyed with a smile during the event. We have conducted health-related activity to prevent for arteriosclerotic disease in Namia town. The program has been held on the monthly event or annual event in Namia town. Not only nurses, but also nursing students conducted health questionnaires, check arthrosis and bone density, and feedback to exam to residents. It has been taking three to four hours each intervention. This program has been used as educational setting. Over 40 nursing students joined this in this program. As a summary, Hirosaki University have organized the Namia Town Reconstruction Assistance Working Group. We have evaluated the dose of residents in Namia Town. As the uh, accumulation of scientific findings, we analyze the effect of radiation exposure on wild animals and analyze the dynamics of radioactive substances in the environment. In addition, chromosome translocation analysis was performed to reduce anxiety among residents. We also verified the contamination and utilization of biomass using plants on contaminated agricultural land. Utilizing the knowledge and results obtained from these studies, we have implemented health support and risk communication programs and have contributed to the development of human resource in Namia Town. Ten years passed, have passed since the earthquake, and the challenges in rebuilding the town are changing. We will continue to support and work closely with Namia Town. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, dear Tomisato, for your presentation. Um, so this was the last presentation in, in our webinar, and we have now 10 minutes, hopefully, to uh, try to answer some of the questions. I will invite all panelists, please turn your cameras on. And uh, uh, once again, I want to, uh, uh, to thank you for your outstanding uh, contribution, for your excellent reports, for staying up very late, specifically for Gillian in Australia is very late. <laughs> um, uh, so let me now check uh, the Q and A's. Finally, I have access to this. Uh, so we have uh, 14 answered questions already in writing and nine are still open. Um, so I'm going to uh, pick some questions. And I think this one, for example, question is about internal dose uh, assessment follow-up. The question is whether uh, internal dose follow-up is planned in future, especially for specific behaviors and uh, uh, lifestyles such as vegetables, gardening, fishing, hunting, uh, etc. Um, who would like to take this question? I think Professor Camilla probably would be the best place to answer this question. Professor Camilla, are you online? Could you turn your camera and microphone, please? Um, Professor um, Kamiya seems to be, maybe he stepped out. Ah, no, he's here, Professor Kamiya. Uh, could you turn on your yeah. microphone? Yes, thank you. Did you hear the question? No, I didn't. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I'm writing the answer to my question. Another uh, answer. Uh, another answer, sorry. This was a question yes. about the internal uh, exposure assessment, whether um, your survey will continue um, the follow-up of the internal uh, dose uh, due to, um, you know, the, for example, is mentioned some specific behaviors and lifestyles, such as uh, gardening, uh, vegetable growing, fishing, hunting. Uh, will you continue monitor 
uh, the food intake in, in this case? Oh, uh, in, in, uh, in the Fukushima Health Management Survey, we don't uh, measure the internal uh, exposure dose. We are measuring the ex external exposure dose mm -hmm. during the first four months. So uh, probably uh, most uh, right person to answer this question is uh, Dr. Uh, I forgot. Sorry. Uh, Dr. Gillian Haas, who re uh, reported the uh, UNSCARE 2020 at this time. Gillian, would you like to and, say? Uh, could you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I, I can answer. I can't specifically answer about what UNSCARE might yes. do in relation to those studies. But certainly, if there are um, institutes or universities or researchers across Japan who undertake those studies and they are published in the peer-reviewed literature. Um, those, those reports could be, those publications could be studies that are taken into consideration in um, future reports um, by the committee. Um, one of our reports that has um, been initiated in the last 12 months is looking at public exposure and that will run from 2020 through to until 2023. So if there are publications about exposures to the Japanese population, they may be taken into consideration in that report. But uh, as far as whether there will be um, other research done, it's, it will be up to individual researchers, universities and institutes um, in Japan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is uh, from Thierry Schneider, and it's to uh, Dr. Hiroko Kitamura. Um, does this survey rely on voluntary involvement of emergency workers? And thus, is there a difference in terms of age structure and exposure compared to the all emergency workers characteristics? And second, within the same question, the second question is, among the emergency workers followed in the survey, do some of them call for compensation for overexposure or disease due to their activity on site? Uh, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, in our study, uh, participation, participation rate is, uh, there is a difference. The older the age group, the higher the participation rate tended to be. Uh, for example, uh, in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, participation rate exceeded 30%. But uh, in their 30s, about 28, 27%. And their 20s, about 18%. There is a difference. And Compensation. Uh, uh, next door. Uh, as far as I know, no one has asked our research group for compensation. Well, I think the question was whether there are um, requests for the government to, uh, to do compensation. But um, if you don't have this information, you don't have to answer. Ah, uh, yes. We don't have uh, information about okay. the compensation. Okay. So next question I would like to bring up is from Wolgan Weiss, who says that in the early phase of an accident, the protection against radiological consequences and intervention is based on numerical values um, of the exposure levels. What are the criteria to be used for protection against the uh, wide spectrum of non-radiological risk, <clears throat> as well as to justify protective actions such as mental health uh, and psychosocial impact uh, support systems? So in other uh, words, I think he's asking what would be the criteria to introduce in certain specific interventions to manage mental health and psychosocial um, uh, impact? Um, with regard to this question, I actually uh, had quickly consulted with our 
colleague uh, who contributed to WHO mental health and psychosocial uh, support framework development, Dr. Fahmihana from the mental health and the um, department. He is looking specifically after mental health and emergencies. And he provided two publications, links to which we shared in the chat session. These are specific documents which developed the evaluation and monitoring criteria for mental health and psychosocial support in emergencies, in any emergencies, not only nuclear emergencies. So I hope that uh, in a way answers your question. As for nuclear and radiological emergencies, we have not yet developed uh, adopted criteria for these situations. This is the next step to roll out the MHPSS framework when we will look into development of practical tools uh, which will support decision makers when and how to introduce at which level the interventions from the MHPSS range. Okay, so uh, one more question. I think this is for Professor Michu Murakami. Uh, saying that great efforts in harmonizing specific evidences perceived and perceived risks by the stakeholders. Uh, may uh, we be able to preset potential effects of risk communications for different disasters? Do you think there are differences for different types of disasters, how you will uh, plan your communication strategy? Thank you. Michio. Thank you. And very difficult question to answer it after this. But uh, uh, first of all, the, the, we should carefully set, uh, think about the, what's the goal of the risk communication. Uh, I, I, I was uh, interviewed with uh, uh, risk communicators after the Fukushima accident. And uh, overall, the, the, the overview of the uh, risk communication of purposes is a uh, uh, recovery of the normal life. You know, of course, it is important to build the trust. And of course, it is important to support the decision. And uh, another says, uh, as a person says, uh, it is important to the, uh, make the, uh, uh, reduce the anxiety. Yeah, all are important. However, the overall, the ultimate goal is uh, the, uh, to uh, recover the normal. I think you all uh, experience uh, to uh, feel the uh, normal life is important under the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. You know, the important point is uh, first, we should think about what is the most important goal of the society. That is the goal of the risk communication. After that, we should set up the, the, the strategy to achieve the, the goal. That, that, that's the, the vision of the risk communication. Thank you very much, thank you. So, and I also, so we only have two minutes left and um, I will uh, take, um, abuse my role of a moderator and ask a question myself to uh, Professor Yamashita. In, in your uh, view, what was the main lesson we learned from these 10 years of follow-up uh, towards the recovery for the public health? We are not talking about nuclear energy, nuclear safety here. We're talking about specifically public health aspect. Could you um, answer this question? Thank you very much, Janat. This is a great opportunity for us from Japanese to introduce and explain correctly what we really learned from the Fukushima accident, especially focusing on public health emergencies. As I overviewed many different aspects and interpretation are prevalent everywhere. But I'm sure the most important thing is to narrow the gap between experts and the public, especially uh, how to understand uh, risk. Not only Japanese, but many people believe zero risk is the most important. But always we should think about the balance between to the benefit and the risk. Not only the radiation exposures, but also the any kind of the risks such as COVID-19. So therefore, the first response of this kind of the accident, we need very good uh, preparations at standpoint of governance and networking and also risk communications. So we really appreciate the Janet's effort to make the tight linkage 
among the Lempang colleagues to strengthen such kind of the solidarities and consortiums and collaborations. I really would like to emphasize the important network to collaborate each other and support each other and share our knowledge and lessons. So thank you very much, Janet, this kind of the wonderful coordination of Fukushima issues. Thank you very, thank you very much. Thank everybody. you. Now I would like to ask um, uh, the head of the radiation and uh, health unit, uh, Dr. Emily van de Winter, to say a few words as closing remarks because we already uh, come to the end of the event. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Janet. And uh, really thank you to all the panelists, the speakers and to the participants. There were over 150 of you throughout this webinar for joining, joining this uh, timely meeting. Uh, from a public health perspective, I guess you have touched upon all the main pillars of an environmental health situation as we faced 10 years ago. From the risk assessment aspect where we've heard from UNSCEAR and their latest report uh, to the monitoring of the situation uh, through the Fukushima Health Management Survey the EPI studies on emergency workers and the monitoring of humans and wildlife even. Uh, also the risk management aspect and the risk communication. And an important point was uh, brought up about community engagement. Looking into the future, the activities related to education, all of these form the picture that we see 10 years later. But really to end, I would like to, uh, to mention that the prompt, the transparent and the openness of our Japanese colleagues throughout these 10 years to share the data and the experiences with the global community has been very much appreciated and really is crucial to learn from such a difficult and hopefully rare event. Well, in terms of rare events, you all know we are currently living through another public health difficult experience with the COVID pandemic. And so I would like to close by saying, please keep safe and healthy. Arigato gozaimashita, soshite oyasumi. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, everyone. We recorded the webinar. I'm going to stop recording here.